All right, hello, WordCamp. Good to see all of you. Uh, glad you all could be here to join us for this keynote this morning. Uh, apologize if you expected us to fly onto the stage in jetpacks or possibly drive out the moon buggy onto this thing. Uh, I think Abby left that at home. Um, but it's an honor and pleasure to be here this morning to talk with you about the web modernization project that NASA has been working on for the last few years. Um, you're probably going to hear us shorten web modernization to web mod. We say that every single day. It's pretty much uh, ingrained in our vocabulary about this project. But that project has started to produce some visible results to the world. Um, just last month, we launched uh, what we're calling a, a public beta of the future NASA flagship website, so NASA flagship equals www.nasa.gov, so that's another thing that's in our language a lot. You might hear us uh, say that. But um, so beta.nasa.gov will ultimately be the WordPress-powered future of NASA's fl flagship nasa.gov system. We're running our final flight checks on that right now. Uh, we'll be launching at a date to be announced very soon in the future. Let's just say pretty soon, definitely not while we're here in National Harbor this weekend. So what we are here to talk to you all about today are the challenges that we faced along the way with this web modernization project and what we've learned along the, te on along the way as we've worked alongside our users to make our dream a reality. And we're gonna try to do that with a minimum number of government acronyms for you. <laughs> so at NASA, what we do, we explore the unknown in air and space. We innovate for the benefit of humanity and we inspire the world through discovery. And if you follow any of our social media accounts from NASA, you know that our content creators are exploring, innovating, and inspiring the world through our digital channels every day. But our first mission into cyberspace wasn't in social media. It was actually with good old HTML back in 1994, almost a decade before WordPress was even a glint in Matt's eye. So see Brian Dunbar, really small and tiny print down in there at the bottom. He's actually our chief, web, uh, chief editor of www.nasa.gov still to this day. So as you explore around the beta site, check for his name down in the footer. All of these sites that you're going to see, we have a lot to thank Brian for. So as the years and decades passed since 1994, our site evolved along with browser capabilities and web design trends. We started putting our agency's inspiring imagery front and center, culminating in our current website that first launched in 2015, which we all know and love, the classic. But as all classics, it's time for a shift. So help set the stage a little bit and give you an idea of where NASA is heading on the web and our digital platforms. We have a short video previewing uh, what lies ahead. and lift off of Artemis 1. All right, so that was a very a teaser sneak peek at three new digital experience from NASA that are coming soon to a screen near you. And WordPress is in integral to all of them at the center or close to the center of all of them. So the most obvious one is what we refer to as, as I said, the NASA flagship. That's powered by WordPress. Uh, it's built to integrate the seamless with our sister site developed by the science mission director, currently operating at beta.science.nasa.gov. Um, and it's, it's a pretty much a traditional WordPress uh, CMS implementation. Lo users log into the WordPress admin, the dashboard, create content, tell their stories with NASA, and deliver that to site visitors coming to uh, the flagship site. 
and that's a plus. One quick call out I'll do for the science friends. So they actually implemented this in a decoupled way. So while we kind of took the traditional route with our custom theme, um, the beta.science.nasa.gov, I think it's a really great example of how we took two different technical approaches to WordPress and we're able to hopefully marry them together in an integrated web experience for everyone. So NASA Plus, uh, it's NASA's new streaming service and an evolution of uh, the NASA TV cable channel. Uh, WordPress serves as a control room functionality within that. So the way that works is we're leveraging the REST API, um, videos on, that are on-demand videos and associated metadata and information about those videos are stored in a, in a separate media digital asset management system. So WordPress, with the power of the REST API, we import, ingest that information. Once it's in WordPress, we have uh, control room users who are managing those videos, putting them into playlists, putting them into topics and categories. And then on the other end of it, uh, the REST API is used again for the NASA apps team. Those are the people who are building tvOS apps, Roku, um, uh, Amazon Fire, uh, and they're using the REST API to absorb all that information and pack it into a, uh, a TV or set-top device viewing experience. And the third one in that video was the NASA apps themselves. These are the, the uh, iPhone, iPad, Android apps, um, similarly to NASA Plus, they are consuming information from both uh, NASA Plus and the flagship um, using the REST API to package that information and present that in the apps. Within the flagship CMS, we actually built a special uh, iOS, uh, Android apps content manager. So NASA Communications people log into the, the flagship WordPress CMS and if, they, if there is a need to highlight specific stories, uh, specific podcast episodes, um, specific NASA missions in a, uh, in a kind of way that is unique and curated specifically for those apps, they can do that within the WordPress CMS for uh, the NASA flagship. Our goal is to basically build a WordPress mission control for the app, for NASA Plus, and for the web experience. Okay, so there was a technology factor uh, initiating uh, this NASA web mod effort. So the current open source management system being used for NASA.gov, uh, it was facing an end of life situation at the time that the web mod effort started a few years ago. Uh, NASA, we took a, took a look at the associated level of effort to upgrade that open source CMS and stay on that platform. And when we evaluated, it was concluded like, this is a bit of a significant project and the level of effort kind of opened up opportunity to look at other CMSs and hopefully I tiptoed around that correctly. <laughs> I come from Drupal, so JJ has to be very, very gentle with me and careful because I love Drupal. Um, WordPress was actually, the first time I was using it as part of my job was when I came to NASA about a year ago, uh, and I love WordPress, but I also love Drupal, right? It's where I got my start. So. so that basically represented an opportunity for NASA to look at the CMS landscape and consider all these alternatives. We spent a year looking at the CMS alternatives. Uh, we looked at both open source solutions, commercial solutions. We gathered evidence about a bunch of them. We narrowed that down to a small handful and we looked at and uh, did some rapid prototyping with our, our users and our content creator users. Um, Another factor was in, in that decision-making process and the evidence that we gathered was the amount of WordPress that was already being used at NASA. There was about 100 sites, 100 different NASA websites using the WordPress CMS, by far the most adopted CMS within NASA. Um, and so there was already some in-place knowledge that was distributed amongst uh, the NASA enterprise around software developers. And so we considered those software developer user types as well. So the WebMod program, we, we were trying to instill a culture of inclusion. Uh, ultimately, there have been some small examples of this. We want software developers um, that are in the various field centers, the various NASA programs and missions, we want them to be building Gutenberg blocks uh, building their own plugins, extending the capabilities of the flag flagship WordPress CMS. So, uh, you know, thus knowledge acquisition and skill building is really important to NASA. So that was a factor in this evaluation as we looked at different CMS solutions. And so, you know, the, the work that this community does uh, to bring all people together, hold word camps like this, both big word camps and regional word camps, share knowledge, build the community and be welcoming and uh, help people learn it, that mattered a lot. So thank you to the word press community for that. So as you might guess, at NASA, we aren't afraid of challenges. 
We boldly set out to do missions of incredible complexity. Artemis is a great example. So as many of you may know, with the Artemis program, our goal is to get to the moon again, to stay, and then use that as our launch pad, our gateway to Mars and the rest of the solar system. So Artemis began in 2017, and just a year after that, in our web modernization world, things got a little shook up. Congress passed a new law called the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act, and of course we have to make that an acronym, so it's the IDEA Act. This introduced quite a few new requirements for federal public-facing websites and digital services, but I think as you'll see, a lot of these are common sense and they're things that all of us should be doing with our websites and digital services across the board. But in government, we've got a lot of old sites, so it is a bit of an effort to get everything up to speed. But so what the requirements in the ID Act centered on is using the web design system that's designed by TTS and GSA. I have to give them a call out. It's an incredible design system. You can go check it out, I think, at designsystem.digital.gov. I think I maybe hear some folks in the audience from there. Um, so we, we built our design system based on theirs. But then beyond that, every site needs to be meeting eight specific requirements. It has to be accessible, first and foremost, to users with disabilities so that everyone can access government information and services. They need to be consistent in visual appearance and design so that people know that they are on a federal government website and we can help cut down on some of the spoofing and getting people confused on where they are. It needs to be authoritative. We need to make sure any information on a .gov site is accurate, up to date, that people know when they go there they can trust that source of information. And it needs to be searchable so that we'll, we'll get onto this with the NASA example, but when people go search for information, we have all this SEO optimized government content for people to be able to find. And then it needs to be secure, user-centered, customizable and mobile friendly. So no big deal, right? We all do that with our websites every day, but at NASA, this was a bit of a tall order for us. So for the last three decades, right, we've been on the web since 1994, we were one of the first federal government agencies to get on the web. Uh, we've had a lot of teams across the agency in those three decades creating countless public websites on every topic under the sun and beyond. So for example, if you go search for the Apollo program, you're gonna find tons of different nasa.gov sites and subdomains, all with incredibly rich content about the Apollo program's history, recordings, pictures, videos. This is an incredible wealth of content. However, it's spread all over the place. And as you can see on some kind of more outdated sites. And so one of our goals with web modernization was to take that burden off of the user of going to all these different places to try to find all of NASA's information about a topic and bring it together into one authoritative topic hub on these different subjects so that users have one place to go, they don't have to keep searching across a universe of content. So this is one of the ways that we were really trying to make our information both searchable and authoritative for our users. I'll add to that that uh, that's one, another reason why that culture of inclusion within this program is, matters a lot. The, the, the teams and resources managing all of that information are, are it, it's very decentralized. So in some ways we need them to be like extensions of the web modernization programs and feel included in both how, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Absolutely. So another challenge was that a lot of our content was filed away according to our very bureaucratic organization structure. So I don't know how many of you guys have memorized the NASA org chart. I haven't yet, I've been here a year and a half. I think people have been there 30 years and they haven't been able to memorize the org chart. So as we found through user research, tree testing, users are struggling to navigate to what they're looking for on our flagship website and elsewhere. Um, many are relying on Google or direct links because the nav menus end up being confusing. No one should have to have a PhD in astrophysics or memorize the org chart in order to find the latest information on a mission or any other topic. So those were the challenges that, were, that NASA faced when the WebMod program was, was trying to solve a little bit. So we had users lost within a sprawling web footprint and new legislation from Congress asking us to fully modernize and consolidate NASA's information into a centralized place. <clears throat> so the response to, the, to all that was to form a WebMod team under Dr. Jim Green, the agency's chief scientist at the time. So working with Blink UX, our team found thousands, whoa. <clears throat> 
That was supposed to be you who did this. I know. I, I've had a sore throat for a week, so that was supposed to be me losing my voice. Uh, so Dr. Jim Green, the agency's chief scientist at the time, led this web, was the first leader of the web modernization team. Abby's here now. So, uh, and then we started working with a company called Blink UX, uh, who helped us identify the thousands of external websites across the agency in, the, in, the, in an initial audit of, audit of that. Uh, the next steps there were to interview and survey members of the public and our, the, the site visitors and users who are end users who are coming to NASA's websites to learn about their information needs and experiences with our web presences. And we took our time with that. So that was what, I think a full year of user research of an extensive survey one-on-one -on -one interviews. So this was a big part of our project, was gathering all that information that we could before we moved forward with the next steps. So in late 2020 and into 2021, NASA began to work on the visual design phase of this project. This actually was running parallel to the CMS evaluation that I was referencing earlier in the prototyping phase, and that had a lot of benefits. So it was an agnostic approach to the CMS. Uh, it kept the design focused on user needs and outcomes instead of like the trap that a lot of us fall into where we start trying to like solutionize things with WordPress and here's how you would do that, here's how you do that. It was free of all that, uh, which really kept the focus on the, the true US, UX experience. And every, every uh, element of that um, experience was, desi was designed and considered with accessibility. So in our interviews with NASA content creators, we heard over and over and over again that they wanted more flexibility and, and room for creativity on the flagship website. In fact, uh, the, the perceived uh, uh, inability to be creative and flexible within the flagship will led them to kind of building their own solutions on their own website and just furthering uh, you know, the problem of, of information sprawl across a lot of different NASA websites. But, you know, again, that was all driven by this need for bespoke storytelling options that they really, really wanted. So, uh, in all those interviews, eventually we started migrating to an atomic design system to deliver a visual language that NASA could use across its digital palette frame while also pro providing controlled ways of correct creative flexibility for storytellers. Uh, if, if you're interested in uh, learning more about atomic design systems, there's a book by Brad Faust. It's an excellent read, and I highly recommend you, you take that up. So, that work. Uh, became known as the Horizon Design System. Uh, another uh, acronym in our vocabulary every day is, it, is HDS, so you might hear us uh, use the, the phrase HDS as we talk, and that stands for Horizon Design System. So that was crafted to help NASA tell its story from the technical to the majestics. And so as we were working through the CMS evaluation process in parallel, it became pretty clear to us that Gutenberg would be a perfect fit for this. Uh, so in the design system, there's a concept of components and modules, and those lended themselves to, to blocks in the Gutenberg editor. There's, and then there's a, a, a further concept of it called templates, which lended itself to block patterns within the Gutenberg editor. So uh, at the time, as I mentioned, we had around 100 or so sites built with WordPress, but they're all, they were all using the classic editor, so there was a little bit of hesitation and, and can, can, can WordPress really, really do this design system and bring that thing to life? But as we prototyped this thing and, uh, you know, and started integrating and testing the integration of the design system using Gutenberg to provide all these storytelling capabilities. And we prototyped and tested that with uh, segments of our content creator user base. It became pretty clear that the potential of WordPress was, was the, the right solution uh, for this project. Before we move on, I'll give you a really quick thing that I really loved coming on learning about the journey that, that NASA and Blink went through to come up with this design system. And you can see it on the left. Uh, we went through a lot of different options and, and iterations of our navigation that you'll see on the site, particularly the desktop version. And as you'll see, we tried a rocket booster kind of vertical menu. We tried a double-decker horizontal, which is more typical of the USWDS, the web design system from GSA. And we actually landed on what we like to call the Murphy bed menu. And basically, it, it opens up, right, comes out. I just love that name. I think it's adorable. So. At NASA, we design amazing missions to go and do amazing things, like explore the surface of Mars. But even with the best of plans, things sometimes just work differently in the real world. You fall into craters, you bump into rocks, you get dust on your sensors. In WebMod, we had set out to empower NASA's content creators to tell their stories using this one cohesive platform and design. We had a great plan. We had everything mapped out, design system, a new information architecture. We were ready to get building. 
But once we actually started bringing in those users into our new CMS and handing them this beautiful new Gutenberg toolkit, we ran into a few bumps along the way. So by 2022, we were well underway bringing that Horizon design system to life in WordPress, identifying existing content from the old CMS to migrate over, and onboarding and training our first core group of users. We set up an internal help site for users. Great idea, right? Website.nasa.gov. We had frozen all of the new domains at NASA, but we like, let ourselves have just, just one new one to help the users. But on that help site, we decided before we had even onboarded the first users to publish the full design system specifications, every single model, module block and template with incredible detail. We thought this was a great idea. We're going to have users be able to explore through this new design system, get familiar with their building blocks, and then once we bring them into the new CMS, they're going to be ready to build. It did not totally work out that way. This backfired a little bit. So once users saw this whole finished product, over 100 pages of all these mock-ups and, and templates, uh, they were a little hesitant to use the more basic MVP versions of those blocks that we had ready for them sitting in the CMS when they came on board. Understandably, right, they wanted to wait until everything was ready. I want everything to look as beautiful as it does in these specifications, and then I'll get to building. But with Agile development, we could not wait for that. We needed them in the system today using and breaking what we'd built so far so that we could iterate and improve. And this gets to our point where we learned the hard way that our design system was our starting point, not our finish line for both us as developers and, and content producers, as well as our user base. So there's a massive variance in the types of content creator users we have. Uh, we have 400 users in the CMS. Some of them are highly skilled, highly comfortable with Gutenberg. Some of them have never seen it before. So one of the things we learned pretty quickly early on is we needed to curate or craft a different editing experience or modify the WordPress dashboard a little bit to help users at their level and help them get comfortable with the design system and all these new tools and possibilities at their, at their disposal. So like any user community, there are a lot of variants in the skills and needs and dreams of all these people. So one of the things we started to do was uh, building a lot more pre-built block patterns within the, the uh, WordPress dashboard. The idea there was like get people creating their stories, authoring something, and, and publishing something as quickly as possible. So instead of trying to figure out uh, with a blank screen, a blank editor screen, like which one of my uh, which 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 blocks do I use? Which what do I put this one on top? Do I put, put this one below? What's the order of all these things? How do I configure them? What are the variations of them? Uh, some basically some pre-built block patterns were, that were also like pre-filled out with some example content that they could start with and start manipulating and modify for their own uh, purposes and business needs. So. Uh, this removed some hurdles, but users were still a little bit overwhelmed. They felt like passengers on an airplane that were, we were building around them as we flew it. And as a result, in the beginning, many of the pages started looking very similar in layout and common. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but not the intention of the design system. And so another key thing we did and that really, really helped is we start, uh, we have a team that we call the web content producers, which I basically refer to as application super users. Uh, and they bring a wide range of experience. They understand institutional knowledge. They understand content strategies. And they're really, really skilled with using WordPress, using Gutenberg. Uh, so they started leading hands-on training and working sessions to build pages in real time alongside our users. It's a lot of community management. Um, There's a lot of communication tools they did, internal blogs, new newsletters, show showcasing uh, some of the great content some of our users were doing. What we found was the community really, really liked seeing examples of what their peers were doing. Um, and then we started fostering that community of inclusion where our, those users were kind of communicating to, with each other and giving each other help, just like this community does as well. So uh, this made a big difference. People liked hearing from each other and seeing what others were building. As they got more comfortable, the users grow, grew more vocal with their needs. And those needs didn't always align with the work we previously planned, so we adjusted our development approach and, based on their feedback and gave weekly demos of our work in progress. I'll also say that the web content producers, you know, um, there's, there's a lot that goes into web storytelling. There's using the design system, you know, how to make your content look good, but then there's also the accessibility uh, information. And so we have all this kind of tooling in there, like there's accessibility checkers that help you monitor uh, what you, how accessible your content is before it's public. There's SEO analysis tools going on. It's a lot of information, like publishing stories to the web, 
uh, in the most effective way uh, you know, takes a lot of data inputs. So the web content producers, they cover all of that stuff. You know, they help make sense of all that stuff for the users who need them. And in a lot of cases, uh, they've, they've, built, they've built hundreds of pagers on behalf of NASA missions, programs, and projects who just need a little more help. And uh, without them uh, really being the, the first tier of support for this, this user community, they're, they're, sometimes they're, they're coaches, sometimes they're um, you know, just a, a shoulder to lean on, some, and sometimes they're, they're just there to kind of psych the users up and encourage them, but they've been really, really assistive and critical in this process. And I'll say, this is kind of a recurring theme for us, where the technology part was actually relatively easy, and the really hard part was the people. And our web content producers, we've got a few of them sitting right here and more online, we couldn't have done this without them. They ended up being the linchpin of our entire project because they were the ones forging those connections with the users, listening to their needs and bringing those back to the development team so that we could be agile and respond to what they needed that moment to get their content onto the next step. So once users started trying to adapt existing content and create new content with the blocks they had and not the blocks they were waiting for, and once devs started feeling freer to branch out and kind of deviate from the design system and really uh, listen to what this user community was telling us and asking for now, we started to see the site and the contents truly come together. Uh, there was a little bit of a refocus on the web mod, uh, you know, strategic approach to this. It wasn't necessarily about the quantity of Gutenberg blocks that we were delivering. It was mostly about the quality, you know, making sure like those things really help people tell the stories in the specific ways uh, that NASA uh, you know, desires and, and, and needs in a lot of cases. So uh, as we build for GoLive, we, we started seeing users doing incredibly creative things with blocks that we never even dreamed of. One example we actually pulled up right here, it's the meet the block, which sounds a little bit like the meatball block. That's not what it is. It's a bunch of little icons that people can put under their big, nice photo header to highlight. It was built, right, to highlight specific people on a given mission, which astronauts are on the ISS at any given point. So we were like, this is a great block. We built it to be flexible, to take different images, text, include little flag icons or not. And then the users got a hold of it. So they used it, you know, in a, the way that we had thought. So looking at the Mercury mission, right, which historical figures linking to their bios. But they also started doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, we had not been able to build their Q&A module yet. And so they used it to build a really cool Q&A bar on their site. Um, they also, we hadn't built, we had built a vertical social media list for them. We had not built kind of a horizontal one. And they wanted it. And they decided not to wait. They used the meat ball, the meat the module to include their social media icons on the page. See, it's hard. So one of the things we discovered as we started building these blocks, and, and if you think about how you build these blocks, and as you, the, it, that starts from original UX specifications, it's a little bit challenging to keep the intention you know, focused on that. So for example, uh, in, in, in the Mitha specification there, there's a little uh, headline that says like, uh, at the station, well, you need editors and content creators, they want to be able to edit that, but you can't, you know, that that means they can edit and put whatever, the heck, whatever they want into it. And similarly, the intention was like to be able to put this with like profiles of astronauts. Well, obviously, you, it's hard to just uh, zero in and narrow that to only showing astronaut avatars and images and only showing astronaut names. But that worked to our benefit, yeah. right? So by building this box in a creative way, in a flexible way, folks were able to use it to do incredible stuff we could never even dream of. So. As I said, right, it's easy, I'll put an asterisk on that, it's easy to change your CMS, but it's hard to change how you do web together, whether in, at NASA, in your company, in your organization. This is a lesson that we learned once, twice, we're continuing to learn it every day, but the hard work was really unifying our internal user community who had been decentralized, all working on their own different websites, and creating a shared vision for what's possible. So when we look at our different user groups, right, on the left, we've got our CIO, our IT and comms folks who obviously have a big stake in the web presence. We have mission directorates from aeronautics to technology to humans in space, and including the science mission directorate, which had over half of our web footprint sharing the incredible science data and information coming out of all of our scientific research and discoveries. Then we had our 10 NASA centers spread across the US everyone from Cape Canaveral over to JPL, they're also all used to having their own website highlighting all the incredible things that their center's doing. And then we have all those little 
uh, agency websites, all coming together into this mosaic of different stakeholder groups, all wanting different things at different times. And our job was to bring them together in one big user family, uh, making sure that they were able to learn how to work together where they hadn't necessarily before to have one page on a given topic, even if it was drawing from content from all across the organization. And that was the right thing to do so that we could present this one unified, sensible uh, presentation of content out to our audience, which ranges all the way from what you might think of normally with, with US taxpayers, educators and students, but we have people coming from across the world to look at our website. No one owns space, right? This is, this, we're doing this for the benefit of humanity. Um, and this was really important for us to make sure that we had our website as accessible as possible to everyone across the world. So how are we going to bridge this gap and get people working together? We came up with a concept we called managing editors. So these were this first core group of folks we brought on board from every mission directorate. We worked with them to designate one or two folks who was, their job was to get on the CMS first, understand the system, and then start onboarding and organizing all of the different users within their part of the org chart, bringing them on board and learning how to work together. Some of these had already done that before. So I'll give a shout out to our aeronautics folks. They are incredible. They had already organized even before we came to the new website and they picked it up like that. But then we had other groups that had never worked together. And so these managing editors, this was not something they got paid to do, right? They had a full-time job and we were asking them to do all this extra work, organizing and, and bringing their people together. And they pulled through. They've done an incredible job. Similarly, at all our NASA centers, same thing, same concept. We had those editors working to unify all of that content and all those users at their center, connect them up with the mission directorates. So I'm doing aeronautics at the Ames Center. I'm connecting back up with the aeronautics group at headquarters and we're making sure that we're bringing all of our content into one place. Uh, so this was a really key thing that we did where we empowered kind of our core early users to do that self-organization, and they basically became an extension of our team. They ended up training themselves, a lot of the users, sending out their own newsletters, sharing information that we did. So to date, we've got 440 of those users onboarded to the new content management system. They've created 3,000 new pages from scratch. So every landing page that you see on the new site, we had no way to migrate that over from the old Drupal CMS. And so for the past year, people have been building by hand, including our own web content producer team, building these new landing pages for every active mission and all of these different topics across our agency down through the information architecture. We also work to migrate 68,000 pages from the old CMS. That's not all of them, okay? What, there's like 100,000? Yeah, it's a fraction. It's a fraction, yeah. I think 200,000. There's quite a few pages on the old site. It's been around since 2015. Every past redesign, they brought over all the old sites, all the old pages. So we took a different approach where we really tried to curate what we brought over, um, leave some of the older content behind. We want to make sure that we keep an archive of it. And it's an ongoing process, too. Like, we're, like we, we had to mature the migration technique so we can start doing this on a, on a daily basis. As we approach the go-live date, we're going, to to, we're going to have to figure out how to do this uh, you know, in, in smaller increments as, as that well, so that in, uh, as well, so that we can just avoid the you know, the duplicate publishing of content in two systems as we approach a go live. And as everyone who's done migration into Gutenberg, Gutenberg blocks knows, that's not really easy. And so we're still working out the kinks in that migration process, but we're getting there. So our takeaway, right? What is the, all these lessons, all these mini lessons filtering up into one big thing that we wanna leave with you today. We're here to build with our users, not for them. Right, so the ethos of WordPress is for everyone. We need our CMS to be for everyone, but that doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen just by installing WordPress, getting your users accounts and letting them go wild. You have to be in the trenches with them, building pages with them, listening to their needs, making them partners in the journey, not just customers. So maybe that's a no brainer for you guys. We had to learn that lesson here and we continue to learn it every day and get better at better at working with our amazing content creators at NASA. And so these are just some of the pages that were built by our hundreds of talented people 
who have already, they come from building award-winning websites, webby-winning websites across the agency, and they trusted us to come into this new CMS and start using the tools to build these new pages. And we're really excited to now be working completely across NASA, across these different silos, to tell one unified story to our global audience. Okay, so we're a moment away from uh, taking some questions here, but uh, one last thing here. Um, you know, Avi and I, are, we're not the only two people working on this effort, though I'm sure there were some days that we both felt like we were the only ones working on it. It took a huge, massive team of, of talented people of different types of skill sets, and we want to take a moment of grat to, to, be, to share some things and give them some gratitude. Um, you know, it, it, took, it, it took a lot of collaboration, and a, a lot of people put in a lot of sweat into this. We won't say it's as complicated as the Apollo program was, as Gene Cernan says here, but it was pretty complicated. I can say, personally, I think for both of us, it is the most complex project I think we've ever worked on in our careers. So these are just many of the incredible people who have been working to be part of the web modernization journey over the years. We wouldn't be standing here with, without their hard work, so thank you to all of them. Um, there's there's hundreds of them. They're not all represented on this slide. Some of, many of them are here today. You can look for some of us wearing these uh, bright orange shirts with the NASA lo worm logo on them. Feel free to approach us. Uh, but we're still just one part of this wider NASA team, this wider NASA family, that's making that dream work in all of our missions, from the depths of the Earth to the furthest reaches of the cosmos. And we are just one part of the larger WordPress community, part of all of you here trying to make the CMS work for our users, to make it do incredible things. And we would not be here without all of the contributions from everyone in the WordPress community to this incredible open source project. So thank you, all of you. All right, so um, if you want to start taking some questions, let me get, tell you a little bit about the breakout session that's happening in the Annapolis room at 1015. Uh, like I said, Team NASA and the orange shirts will be there. Um, you can come to there and ask us technical questions. Uh, if you want to sit with somebody and look at some code, how we, how we did some things, like how we integrated the flagship WordPress CMS with uh, the images.nasa.gov, so content creators can use those assets within uh, their stories. Uh, you can do that if you want to. Uh, tour the site, surf the site with someone and shoot, see different parts of it, that's a possibility. If you want to sit down and actually use the block editor, publish the page in a testing environment, a staging environment, uh, and create a NASA story for yourself, that's something you can do as well. Uh, so please join us there uh, in the Annapolis room at 1015. But before we jet off, we will now take a few questions. So I think there are maybe mics around the room, I'm not sure how if Julia's here, how she wants us to take questions. Or you can just shout really loud. I'll repeat it. Sure, so the question, he's from another government agency, and his question was, how do we approve users to come onto the new CMS in the first place? How do we make sure that people are approved to become, have user accounts, go through legal, all of the different lovely review processes we have to go through in government to make sure what we're publishing is accurate? Um, so we have actually a kind of an open door approach, which maybe is a little unique, but all of our mission directorates and centers have existing really robust approval processes for publishing content. So actually, before they even get to us, um, before they're even ready to put a new story into the new CMS, that story has already gone through all of the normal approval channels before it comes to us. So we were able to kind of leave that there for now as it was working and have an open door approach of, hey, if you work at a center or a mission directorate, right, you're a NASA employee or contractor and you have a need to use the CMS, you're welcome in. Of course, like any site, we've got user permission levels, so we limit who has the ability to you know, create in certain content types, who has the ability to delete content, that's all a little more locked away, right? But anyone can go and publish their own content and edit their own content. One other thing I'll bring up quickly is, um, what was I gonna say? No, 
Do you have something? Uh, I think Go you ahead. were. I think you might were interested in talking about Gutenberg Phase Three and the collaboration of that. That but is what I was. That, before yep. you do that, okay. um, so in addition, uh, we do require our new users to go a little bit of to take a little bit of on-demand training. Um, to get familiar with WordPress concepts using the block editor, what are post types, what are categories, and stuff like that. There's also a concept that we're really interested in, uh, which basically is, you know, role level, so different types of training to, to have diff additional capabilities, uh, the, you know, for example, to be basically uh, the, the ability to be an editor versus an author. So as JJ reminded me, we are so excited for Gutenberg phase three with all of those different capabilities for live editing together, like a Google Doc in a WordPress CMS. How cool is that? All those different new tools that will be coming soon to WordPress and Gutenberg to be able to collaborate and actually probably move some of those approval processes into the CMS itself. So instead of doing all the drafting in a Word document outside and sending it through the approval process, starting to draft your story in the CMS and sending it through those approvals within the system. So that's the dream, and we got to make it happen. Other questions? Yeah. Great question. So the question's on SEO and how we're accounting for, as we consolidate these different subdomains into one place, how are we preserving existing SEO value and making sure our new pages are really easily findable by people who might be used to looking them in the old place? Um, so we've just begun that consolidation journey. That's really this whole giant phase two of the project. But we're making sure that we're keeping those subdomains on, redirecting, ideally at a page by page level basis to the new pages so that we can retain some of that really rich SEO. One great example of this actually is the new beta.science.nasa.gov site. So previously, a lot of that science content was published on the flagship, but it was actually published in three or four different places, right? The mars.nasa.gov site, the solarsystem.nasa.gov site, and the flagship. And so one thing we wanted to do is decrease that duplication and make sure that as we migrated things over, we were migrating science content over to the new science website uh, so that we could make sure users have that information findable and not lose their old bookmarks and links. That being said, we're probably going to break some links, and we got a plan for that. Yeah, so part of the SEO conversation within NASA is just, it's quite honestly, it's just building awareness of it. It hasn't really had a whole lot of great consideration. The shift from uh, NASA organization structured, organized uh, you know, information to topical based. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of awareness building we have to do around that and getting, getting people who are telling their stories, publishing content to, to consider how users are wanting to find and interface with that type of information as opposed to how NASA thinks about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Great question. Hi, is it open source? Oh man. Is it open source? I, I knew that question uh, okay, was I'll repeat asked. it for the <laughs> online. So, is it open source? If so, where is it? If not, when is it going to be? I totally. I was. I, I was excited for somebody to ask that question. I, I, <laughs> so, as as anywhere in government, of course, we have a long bureaucratic process for making code open source, but we're in the middle of that now. So, hopefully, soon we'll be able to share that code with the public. It's it's going through its nice approval process as yeah. we speak. Bottom line here is the intention and the spirit of the web modernization program, just like, you know, NASA, it's in NASA's original charter to share what they learn with the world. And to some degree, uh, you know, releasing the, the stuff that we've been building, the blocks that we've been coding as an open source, uh, in an open source way as an extension of that ethos. I don't know if you want to mention the work that your folks have been doing outside of the NASA project on the US web design system theme. Yeah, so um, one of the things we've learned about, uh, as, as Evie mentioned, a um, requirement we have in the IDEA Act, it mentioned accessibility, consistency, search, security, all that kind of, and then it's, it's funny how it's phrased, it, and it's almost like the ninth requirement. And also, uh, federal websites must adopt the US web design standards. So, which is, it's kind of interesting, we had this UX specification, which was very specific, and the US web de design system also kind of has a lot of specificity, so we had to figure out how to bridge all that stuff and, and, uh, and integrate it within a WordPress, WordPress uh, you know, block editor system. So we learned a lot about that, and uh, that work has uh, resulted in a, a theme product that my company has been working on called CivicPress, and 
So basically what that does is bring the US web design systems to a you know, Gutenberg ready, full site editing WordPress theme um, for, uh, you know, to help public uh, sector agencies uh, with their web modernization. And if you want to try an early alpha of that, go to civic, civicpress.us. Um, you can launch uh, a, uh, an environment on Insta WP with, uh, with that. All right. Thanks I think for letting me here. plug, Abby. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> go ahead. Can you share a little bit about how you work with accessibility from planning new blocks to having that block placed in a page or template? And finally, how to ensure that the content creators create accessible content? Absolutely. So the question was, how do we bring in accessibility everywhere from when we first build the block to educating our users on how to use that block in an accessible way? Great question. Obviously something we really care about. We had actually a whole section on accessibility that we had to cut because we didn't have enough time, but we would love to give a talk just on that part of our project in the future. So we worked with a company called Equalize Digital. They have a free accessibility checker for Gutenberg and WordPress. And we actually worked with them to actually expand that tool, the free version of it, to make sure that everyone could use some of these features we really wanted to have at our content editor's disposal. Uh, but we know that automated accessibility, the things that an automated checker can check, is I think about a third of all of the different requirements under the, um, the WCAG, and I forget the whole name of it, um, but the Section 508 or WCAG standards for accessibility, um, we wanted to make sure that we were actually meeting the full extent of the law and not just checking the box. So we had manual audits go through all of our, all of our whole page level templates, every single block as we develop it to make sure each block in isolation, both on the back end and on the front end was fully 508 compliant. Because we don't just care about our external users using the site, we also care about our internal content creators who are using assistive technology, making sure that they can use the site to its full power as well as our external users. So great question. We have more work to go, but. Yeah, um, yeah Equalize Digital, they were a great partner on this. We really couldn't have done it without them. Like they helped us on various levels of uh, the WordPress solution architecture, taking a look at, at the accessibility um, uh, elements of all those things. And uh, Amber and, and, uh, is going to be at the breakout session. If you want to see Accessibility Checker Pro in action uh, with uh, you know, the WordPress CMS that we built for NASA, you can do that there. All right, so I'm looking back at Matt there. I'm going to call you out. How are we doing on time? Do we have no more questions or one more? One more. One more little question, if anyone has one. Otherwise, please come join us in the Annapolis room at 1015, and we will get hands-on with y'all. Thank you so much.